is one of the greatest gamblers who ever lived. In the world of poker, Slim is an icon. One of the most famous poker players that there ever was. And one of the players who first brought Hold'em to Vegas. Best players in the hometown, they'd come out here. Man, we eat them folks up like a ginger cake. Slim was legendary for showing no mercy. What do you got? If you need to get down to his knees, do whatever to win, that's Slim. He's got more gall than anybody I've ever known. Well, Slim would do almost anything to win. He's a chameleon. He'll be whatever you want him to be. But at the end of the day, you're broke. Being a great hustler, he's looking for any edge he can get. Slim would use that edge to his advantage whenever possible. Nobody could make a game like Slim. He made games where he couldn't lose. Well, he could do things that, you know, were out of the ordinary. I delighted in human misery. It was a tonic for my old skinny buddy. As a Texas road gambler, he would stare down death numerous times. If you think it's easy to look down one of them double barrel shotguns, you're wrong. And mete out his own justice. I caused those people some misfortune. When I was found hanging. Amarillo Slim calls a cold blood. Amarillo Slim, anything to win. all the rage. Now we're playing some poker. Everywhere you look these days. No guts, no glory. <laughs> Everywhere you turn, poker is being played. Oh, oh, no. In our homes, on our computers. He does get the flush. And all over TV. We're not here for fun, Roxy. <laughs> Celebrities and the average Joe alike fancy themselves rounders. Make us funny. I'm officially out of this one. In 2005, sales of poker chip sets topped $10 million. Wow. Worldwide revenues from online poker sites are expected to top two and a half billion this year. And at the 2005 World Series of Poker Championship, thousands of players competed for a first place prize of seven and a half million dollars. Finally, everyone's seeing what a great game it is. I think poker is just going to keep getting bigger and bigger. I mean, it's just amazing how many people have come into poker nowadays. Gambling today is, is good because everybody's doing it and it's exciting. He's all in. It's not gambling. It's a, a, poker is a sport. It's an eight. It's over. A standing ovation. The house is rocking and rolling. The sports boom humbly began with a handful of players. One of them was Amarillo Slim. I hear it from my peers and they say, look here. Honey, this is the man that caused us not to be working right now, and we've got this good income because of this guy right here. But Slim was much more than a poker player. He was a card-playing, pool-hustling, quick-talking, high-stakes gambler who was as cutthroat as anyone had ever seen. I'm taking it. Well, Slim would do almost anything to win. Very calculating. He was a gifted person. He's definitely got the gift of being a great hustler. Very driven to be successful no matter what it takes. He was hugely aggressive player. He had an, an intuition for the game that was uncanny. What he's good at is wine and dine the sucker. And after that, they become good buddy, buddy. In the meantime, he try to take all his or her money. That's why Slim and I never play much of poker, because I'm not a sucker. Slim is the Buddha of getting inside your head. He will psych you in a way that you will become paranoid of things that you're not even aware of. He'll tell a couple of stories, a couple of his sayings, and two hours later he walks out of the place and the place goes, what happened? Who was that masked man? The masked man was Thomas Austin Preston Jr. T.A. Preston grew up on a ranch in a small Texas community. The only child of divorced parents, he moved to Amarillo when he was 11. He started hustling fellow students in high school. And by the time he was 15, he was a bona fide pool shark. Well, Slim is an excellent pool player. You know, he's probably in the top one-tenth of one percent pool players in the world. I mean, he was world class. Uh, and plus, he took all of his country charm and his bull <laughs> to the pool hall. His reputation as a phenom was growing, but he knew he needed a catchy nickname, 
he would take a cue from Rudolf Wanderon. Wanderon was a traveling pool hustler, better known as New York Fats. Later, he changed his name to Minnesota Fats, and soon after gained great notoriety from his televised matches with the legendary Willie Moscone. When I started playing in, in tournaments, well, everyone knew I was from Amarillo, and I had to get out of the bathtub before I pulled the plug, and I scared to death I'd go down the drain. So slam was a normal thing, and uh, if there was a New York Fats, then why shouldn't there be an Amarillo Slim? In a few years, Slim would teach Fats a hustling lesson of his own as their lifelong rivalry began to blossom. But first, he would take a shot at fleecing the U.S. Army. We did some things that were daring. Everybody was after us. It was illegal to do it. In 1942, the war hung in the balance for months. Toward the end of World War II, the U.S. government offered an early graduation to any high school senior that enlisted in the armed forces. Slim jumped at the chance. I could see Duck in about three months of school, so I joined the Navy. An atomic bomb is taken to an isolated area in the Pacific. On one of his first missions, Slim was involved with the atomic bomb test in the Bikini Atoll. His job was to help move native islanders away from the test site. I guess we were probably 19 miles from the center of it. He volunteered for the job because he knew the long four-day sail back to Hawaii would give him ample opportunity to hustle his fellow sailors. I didn't sleep for about three nights. Wasn't anything to do except play poker. Slim won so much money from his fellow sailors that he had to make room for all the cash in his duffel bags. But on Lula, I threw all my clothes over the side and filled my seat bags full of money. After serving a few months in the Pacific, Slim's ship was decommissioned to Astoria, Oregon. When he wasn't playing pool or cards on the base, he was making bets in nearby Portland. This is the seventh and deciding game for the World's Baseball Championship. His first big wager was on the 1946 World Series between the Boston Red Sox and the St. Louis Cardinals. There's rumors I made a pretty good sized bet for a guy that didn't have a job. In Game 7, Sox shortstop Johnny Pesky hesitated before making a throw to the plate. And sends the cards into a one run. That play cost the Sox the series and Slim $30,000. It was a tough deal for the Sox, but victory was in the card. I, I, man, I can see the play. I just, and that one play cost me that. Slim would shrug the loss off, but he swore... He would never bet again unless he had some inside information. He would spend the rest of his life looking for an edge. I wasn't just looking to fly by the seat of my britches. I don't believe in luck. I believe that you make your own luck in life, whatever your endeavor is. As World War II was ending in the mid-40s, Slim was discharged from the Navy. He returned home to Amarillo, his pockets lined with hundreds of thousands of dollars he had won from gambling at cards and sports in the Navy. But in a matter of months, the money was all gone. I blew most of that money on chasing the broads or, or buying cars. I thought everything was just a bed of roses, and it, it finally ran out. But it didn't ever seem to bother me any. I was young and I had the ability to go make it again. And I thought that the fastest way for me to get reloaded was to go to Europe because I'd heard some stories over there. Intrigued by the tales he'd heard of the black market in post-war Germany, Slim joined the army. 
Knowing that he was an exceptional pool player, the Army had Slim assigned to the Special Services Division, where his only job was to entertain the troops with a weekly pool exhibition, leaving him plenty of time to execute his next scam, selling goods on the black market. Let me tell you, everybody wanted cigarettes and gasoline you couldn't get, coffee you couldn't get, chocolate. You couldn't get nylon stockings during the war. Anything you couldn't get, uh, I could get it. Slim bribed personnel from the base's post-exchange market to sell him staples such as gas, cigarettes, chocolate, and nylon stockings at vastly reduced prices. You have 39 cents a pair for him wholesale. I sold them for $10 a pair. Well, that's a pretty big markup. All Slim needed now was a bunch of cars to transport the contraband. To help acquire this armada, he placed a large bet on the 1948 GI World Series between the 101st Airborne and the 547 Engineers. But with the memory of Johnny Pesky still fresh in his head, Slim decided he wouldn't leave anything to chance this time. So he bribed the heavily favored 547. Prior to the game, I took three of their superstars off the 547 Engineers. And I took him to the Excelsior Hotel and a big dinner and everything. Blind him and dined him. I said, you boys ever had any money? No, sir. I said, you got a chance to make some? They said, what do you mean make some? I said, could you all, if y'all was to lose the first game, could you still win the GI World Series? Sure. We could beat them. The first game was where most of the money was bet. I said, well, just play flawless. Just play your ass off, but don't ever hit that ball out of the infield. I see to it that you get a hold of some money. I got the GI World Series fixed. I'm not necessarily proud of that, but I can exonerate myself because I, I didn't throw the game. Now, I might have had it thrown, but I didn't do it. I don't know whether that's justification for doing a no-no, but I did it. And, uh... It was good for me. Slim swindled his fellow servicemen out of more than just cash. He took their cars, too. There had to be over 20 car titles. They were Jeeps, mostly. With his fleet now in place, Slim's black market operation thrived. But eventually, the military would catch wind of his illegal activities. I can't stand the heat and get out of the kitchen. Well, I needed to get out of the kitchen. I decided that the best place for me was in dear old America. Slim left the Army after a year of service. He stuffed over $300,000 in cash in his duffel bag and wired the rest back home. Well, when I come back from overseas from the European trip, well, I, I was definitely a millionaire. Uh, I think I was 19. But upon his return, Minnesota Fats was lying in wait to hustle Slim out of his fortune. He couldn't imagine some of the things I could do with a broom. How in 1948, Amarillo Slim returned home from post-war Europe, a 19-year-old millionaire. In New York, the GI point of re-entry to the U.S., Minnesota Fats was eagerly waiting in the pool halls for soldiers looking to make a quick score before they went home. Amarillo Slim made perfect prey. I went to the pool room. Fats was there. Everybody figured out who I was. In other words, I had a reputation. So Fats matched a game with me, and uh, I couldn't win that. I didn't win at it. I lose a big number to him. And then Fats found out for sure that he should have won an awful lot better figure. Fats never won a single major tournament, but always had a nose for a good score. Once he realized that Slim still had a lot more money to lose, Fats followed him back to Texas. By the time I got back to him, I realized probably six or eight weeks why Fats was here. And he come to play and he got to play. Refusing to lose face again, but knowing that he couldn't beat Fats straight up, Slim desperately began searching for some sort of leg up. 
he found it in his old bag of tricks. I had developed a means of playing pool with a broom. I always had some gimmicks and gadgets. You needed to have something that everybody else didn't have. I had practiced a long time with that, and it was one of my best gimmicks. Slim bet Fats that he could sink four balls with his broomstick before Fats could sink eight with a regular pool cue. The trick of winning money when you play pool is how you make the game. And Slim was great at making games. He made games that the person thought there's no way they could lose this game. And Slim knew that the opposite was true and it held up. Fat's sure thing quickly turned into a nightmare. They would play the same game for hours until Fats was completely cleaned out. He couldn't imagine some of the things I could do with a broom. And so Fats was hustling everybody else, and Slim was hustling him. There was a big shot New York broker that uh, lost a pretty good size figure coming down here and trying to beat a country son of a bitch. I knew Minnesota Fats, and he and Slim were about equals when it came to talking, so I, I don't know exactly what evolved there, but... I'm sure, I'm sure it would have been a fun thing to watch. To find out just how hard it is to play pool with a broom, we challenged Dave Hemma, a top 20 money winner in the U.S. Professional Pool Players Association. Playing with a broom will be very difficult because, for one thing, you don't have a tip. You don't have anything to put chalk on to make a good connection with the cue ball. It's very short and there's not a lot of room here, you know, to put any kind of stroke or anything on it. You just don't know where the cue ball's going. I missed the ball completely. Oh, man. Trying to hit the edge of this is just so hard. You can't see it very well. Man, this is tough. This guy must have practiced for years. The residue of the broom, man. I can't get a lot of speed on it. Never missed so many times. Now Dave executes a classic pool, sh pool shot with a normal cue. Now, as you can see with the cue stick, that was pretty easily done, and I got a nice shot on the eight ball to, to win the game. Now he tries the same shot with a broom. This might be a tougher task. Once again, failure. As you can see, I was trying to draw the cue ball. I couldn't do any of that. I was trying to make shots a little longer, and it, it seemed like the broomstick was always hitting the table. Just very difficult. I don't know how Amarillo Slim did this. Uh, I can't even queue up on anything. It's, it's amazing he could beat anybody, let alone uh, Minnesota Fats. Slim and Fats squared off several times over the years, with Slim usually coming out ahead. I beat him in an exhibition later years at Reno, Nevada. And he told me, he said, if you want some publicity, you son of a bitch, go set yourself on fire. I never will forget it. With his reputation growing, games became harder and harder to come by in Amarillo. Slim pondered his next move. I didn't want a job. Uh, my girlfriend said when a man works, he sweats, and when a man sweats, he stinks, and they didn't like stinking men. Slim would begin to show signs of settling down. In 1949, he got married and soon after had children. But refusing to give up the gambling life altogether, he began trying his hand at poker. I was in Midland, Texas, and I hadn't played a lot of poker at that time. There was a high poker game, so I went down there to play in it. And I met Doyle Brunson and Sailor Roberts. Doyle Texas Dolly Brunson and Brian Sailor Roberts. Two Texans hooked on cards, just like Slim. Slim broke us that day in Oklahoma, Sailor and myself. He got ready to leave, and I said, you guys got any money? Hell no. And I said, y'all want some money? And Sailor, he said, did you ever see a broke son of a didn't want some money? So I gave him 2500 I never did expect to get it back. If you bust somebody out, you give them walking money. You give them bus money. It's an old credo. It showed that he did like us and, you know, that he trusted us. And we got back home and we sent him the money right away. My good quick pay makes lasting friendship. We bonded along with Sailor Roberts. We got to talking about, you know, the dangers and the pitfalls of being out on the road and going to these poker games. There's a lot of problems. You get arrested, you get cheated, you get robbed. So we decided to, to form a partnership that we would play out of the same community bankroll. 
the three rounders would split all their winnings and all their losses, whether they were playing in the same game or not. It wasn't a secret thing. We never made a signal in our life to the other one. There was no conspiracy with us. Three of them became best friends and they traveled together and played off the same bankroll and pretty much did everything together for many years. We lived together, we slept together. Sailors the only grown men that ever kissed me right in the mouth. Pooling their resources and talents, the trio posed a formidable threat. We hit the poker circuit and, and man, we hit it. And we looked like a vacuum just sucked up every loose thing. Always thirsting for that extra buck, they also began a bookmaking operation. I didn't figure I was a bookmaker. I told my federal judge that I speculated on the outcome of sporting events. Think about that for a minute. <laughs> But even working as a team, their lives were in constant danger. I had a sawed-off shotgun and had it right against my belly. Should have just went ahead and pulled the trigger on me. What? Can I hear these uh, fellas, I start to say boo, scream about how unlucky they are. That's not luck. You know what I tell them? If you spend more time in the field plowing, less time here at the golf course, you'd be luckier. Slim, <laughs> he talked like a country bumpkin because that's what he is. <laughs> that's right, a heart and a heart. If he start talking to me, I would laugh at him. I'd say, Slim, what, are, what do you think he's doing? It won't work. He teases people a lot. They'll call him by the wrong name, like he likes to call money maker money penny and stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> all that Amarillo. Boy, all that just comes out of it naturally. Some of these guys, they might wet on your legs and till you. It's raining outside. You know what I'm saying? In the early 60s, Amarillo Slim, Doyle Brunson, and Sailor Roberts went from town to town cleaning out all the local poker players. Getting in and out of a game with the town's money and getting out of town that wasn't easy i mean people get pissed off when they lose money i can't imagine how scary some of the things he went through was i don't think i could go on the road and play poker if i was worried about my life the question wasn't whether you would win the question was getting out of there alive let me tell you if you think it's easy to look down one of them double barrel shotgun and some son of a bitch is shaking to start with you're wrong. This is a tough business back then. If you win, you worry about getting busted. If you lose, you, you, you might even get robbed when you go outside. I have the good credit. He's a hustler, and he got to do what, what he had to do to survive. You know? We were robbed several times. We were arrested too many times to remember. But police and angry locals weren't the only dangers they faced. Robbers would often stake out the games waiting for the players to exit with their winnings. I got hijacked in Atlanta. I was gagged, taped, wired bound, and put in the bathtub. And at that time, they was uh, putting that water treatment to a lot of people, making them go get money. I thought they were going to hold me under that water in the bathtub. The three robbers took all of Slim's loot and left him wired up and bleeding in a hotel bathroom. It seemed like I'd been in there 15 hours. I can't holler, and I'd try to bang my head on the side of the tub, but there's nobody to hear him. Eventually, a hotel maid would find Slim and call the police. But when they questioned him about his attackers, Slim refused to answer, preferring to take justice into his own hands. Oh, well, I wasn't going to say anything. We had our own means. I caused those people some misfortune. One of them turned himself in for protective custody and was found hanged in uh, Kansas City. I'm sure he committed suicide. One of them was outside of Pecos, Texas, and he'd evidently run through a fence. He had a bad incision. Another one was at Port Aransas in South Texas. He probably uh, come into contact with some weight, but that uh, well, I don't know. I don't know what happened to him.
Poker's a hard way to make an easy living. Next up, Slim takes his ruthless act to the city of sin. After years spent hunting down backroom card games, the trials and tribulations of life as a Texas road gambler would eventually wear on Amarillo Slim and Doyle Brunson. But with their thirst for gambling still not quenched, they would finally answer the clarion call of the desert's growing oasis of sin. mid-60s, Las Vegas was firmly entrenched as America's top gaming destination, but it still wasn't a place for high-stakes poker. Slim and Doyle sought to change that. They rode into town looking to break some Vegas hotshots with their little old game from Texas. Hold'em was a Texas game. Doyle and Slim, they brought Texas Hold'em there, and it was kind of an inside game. The nucleus of professional players that were here, they weren't that proficient and hold them. Best players in the hometown, they'd come out here, we'd treat them like a stepchild. Man, we eat them folks up like a ginger cake. So we caught a lot of uh, big money people. They'd probably been drinking, they wanted to play poker. And the games weren't really big, but they were really lucrative for us. And it's such a great game that once the players played it, that's all they wanted to play. <laughs> That's the best thing ever happened to a game of hold'em bring to Las Vegas. Once they play the game of hold'em, and they never quit because this game is it's very, very exciting and very challenging and, and it's fun. This is the grand finale. The winner gets 50,000. Hold'em starts with two cards face down. He will find queen seven. Liebert with a distinct advantage going to the flop. Then three community cards are turned face up called the flop. Amazing. Warburton flops three of a kind. This is trouble for Kathy Liebert. Liebert goes all in. Oh. And he calls. Up next, the turn or fourth street. Liebert's face tells the story. And finally, the river or fifth street. Kathy Liebert is drawing dead on the river. The best five card combo wins. Patrick Warburton wins the grand finale at Poker Pro. Kathy Liebert finishes runner up. Texas Hold'em is the Cadillac of poker games. You never know what you have until you have it, and that may not be good enough unless you have the nuts. Todd bets 180,000. But in order to become really good, it comes with experience. Knowing when to bluff, reading players, you have to learn, you know, how to read your opponents and knowing when to call and when to hold. Hold'em is a versatile game. It's very easy to misrepresent your head. Well, if you got an ace, you got me. I call. It's like chess, but there's lying, which is bluffing. Johnny will win the pot with a pair of jacks. 585,000. It's a very important in Hold'em to watch your opponent and to observe him. So far, he's read Lee like a map every single time he's glanced at him like that. And that goes back to Slim and I talking in the wee hours of the morning. We would talk about people, about how they react. Don't mess with this man. You can't train for it. And you've got an innate ability to do it or you don't. It's just that simple. And most people betray themselves in their speech. Jack betting is Slim's way. Amarillo Slim calls what looks to him like a transparent bluff, and he's right. Strauss is caught in a cold blood. He has nothing. Go it over here. Slim's ability to elicit tells from tableside chatter was legendary. He talks all the time. He gets inside people's head. He hypnotizes them. Wait a minute, count Spanish. Slim talks people out of winning. Those chips have no value uh, with me. They're just clay. If you need to get down to his knees, do whatever. To win, that's slam. <laughs> in case Mr. Holt wins it, I'll be in his hometown before he gets back home. I assure you. He did give the impression that he was just a country bumpkin, when actually he was a very sophisticated, very good player. Anyone that differs with that opinion, I'm not hard to find. The wily Texan would befriend his opponents so that even in defeat, they would go home happy and would eventually come back for more. 
I'm ready. I'm playing this game a lot better than I played it last year. It suits me. You can shear a sheep a many a time, and he'll reproduce. You can only skin him once. So I try to shear on one of them, and next year when I see him, he's grown some more wool, and he's a reproducer. And there's another thing about the sheep. Very, very seldom do the lambs slaughter the butcher. And I think I'm the butcher. Very soon, the butcher would put the entire poker world on notice. The Mac and really get it some attention. He's got the, the boots and the outfit and the whole deal. He walks into the world says a poker, and he's dressed like your idea of a poker player. He's got a lot of swagger. As high-stakes poker swelled in popularity in Vegas in the late 60s, the players began to organize. Thus was born the World Series of Poker, a collection of the best players in the country Come on over here, doll. gathered together in Vegas to play for all the marbles. The World Series of Poker is where we declared who was the best player. Jack Strauss, and Puggy Pearson, and of course Johnny Moss, and Amarillo Slim, and Doyle Brunson. It was a fight to the finish. Benny Binion's Horseshoe Casino. The tournaments were more like marathons, often lasting for days, testing any player's mettle. We played until it was over. You didn't, you didn't take breaks like we do now. I had an ability to play two or three days and nights without ever leaving the room. Everybody would say, he hadn't even left the room, he hasn't eaten. That was a lie, they didn't know it. When I'd go to the restroom, I'd take a bite of raw honey, and hell, it'd pump me up. Everybody else either took liquor or some kind of drug, and they're hiring a guy. This is perfect for me. The venerable Johnny Moss would win the first World Series in 1970. In 71, Slim gave Moss a run for his money, but played second fiddle to Johnny's second straight title. The next year, eight players entered the tournament. Slim was as confident as ever. I'm taking it. I didn't think anyone else had a chance. I thought everyone was playing for second because I had already spoke for first. One by one, the players fell until it was just Slim and Puggy Pearson. It was just like two freight trains running together. Puggy Pearson was the man in Las Vegas poker at that year. I says, well... I'm going to knock all the tail feathers out of the buggy. I felt it'd be good for him to build character, of which he was lacking a little in character. Slim waited until he had a strong hand and then moved in on Puggy. I had a king and a jack. He made some sort of a wager, and I, I hollered, I'm moving in, and the crowd hollered. He's moving in, and it feels better in. Go all in. That was a, a big thing. I mean, when he did it, he did it very dramatically. Thinking Slim was bluffing, Pearson bet his last dollar. When the flop come, uh, it come king, 8-8. Eight, eight. If he's got 8, I'm practically dead. But Puggy wasn't holding an 8 in his hand, and Slim became the World Series of Poker champion. He hung on, and, and he beat Puggy. Puggy said, I would have won that particular year if Slim didn't talk him out of it. What he smelled cooking wasn't on the fire. He looked a little peaked and pale around the gills, so I, I smoked him. That's all there is to it. And it must have ended about 2 in the morning, and at 7 o'clock I was walking around looking for another game. Please join me in welcoming the world champion poker player, Amarillo Slim. 1972 was the year of Slim. He won it and he bragged about it. Went on every talk show imaginable. They anticipate losing when they sit down, and I don't disappoint them a damn bit. Slim appeared on magazine covers, in TV shows. Well, we'll have at least three quarters of a million dollars, but eh? Try to bust your little penny while you'd get part of it back and even in the Hollywood movie, California Split. Slim fully understood the value of publicity. He wanted to be the star of the game. Everyone said that uh, 
that I was the Muhammad Ali of poker, that I uh, was a goodwill ambassador. His goodwill garnered a good deal of notoriety. After you're a success in the poker world, people do come after you, and that's what they did with Slim. One year after being crowned the world's best poker player, Slim made a wager he would later come to regret. A wager that would almost cost him his life. I defer as the world champion, man. When Amarillo Slim won the 1972 World Series of Poker, he became a target for anyone wanting to make a bet. It's open season on me, you understand me? Yeah. Everybody's out to you. Yeah, that, that yeah. suits me, you understand? All peppers don't wear fur caps. <laughs> no, <laughs> you're all right with me. A lot of famous people wanted to rub shoulders with Slim. From presidents to rock stars to outlaws, you name it. They all wanted to be part of Slim's adventure. Because they knew it would be fun. He was the personification of action. In 1973, old card-playing rival Jimmy the Greek Snyder gave Slim all the action he could handle. He bet $31,000 that Slim couldn't raft down one of Idaho's most rugged and wild rivers in the cold of winter. Jimmy the Greek always kind of didn't like Slim. Slim had talked about he was a real good rafter and went down a lot of rivers. And Jimmy knew about a uh, river that nobody had ever successfully gone down it before. It was very dangerous. So he bet Slim, and Slim just... Uh, kind of boisterously said, okay, I'll take the bet. And then he found out about the river. The river of no return, they called it. I thought it was a dangerous thing. I thought it was pretty stupid to risk your life to try to, to win a bet. Per his legendary M.O., Slim took extraordinary precautions. He scouted the area by helicopter, had a raft built to withstand the icy waters, and hired Jacques Cousteau to make him a custom wetsuit. He got a wetsuit that, you know, he can survive in the Arctic for 20 years. I mean, he builds in advantages. Slim was joined on the trip by good friend and fellow rafting enthusiast, Jerry Chapman. First three days, we didn't have any problems that were severe. Then on the fourth day, it got very, very dangerous. Be a little touchy right down here. Things went real bad for me. Our raft had hit a rock. And it's not going to be long till that raft's going to be nothing. It's going to be shreds. I was facing the threat and probably the reality of losing my wager. Plus, there was a time there that we didn't think we was going to get out of there. In one of the most dangerous sections of the river, Slim's raft got stuck on a rock. So Jerry says to me, my God, we're in trouble. He said, somebody's got to get in the water. And when he said somebody, I was pretty sure he wasn't talking about himself. With a rope tied around his waist, Slim dove into the water and freed the raft. Once I released it, naturally it's in the main current. Here it goes. He got dragged through that haystack rapid, hitting every rock that there was in the river. It seemed like an eternity. Eventually, Slim pulled himself back into the boat and then rested overnight by the river. Two days later, he would reach the finish line. I wouldn't do it again. And believe it or not, there hadn't been an influx of fools start trying to do it. No one's tried it since. Slim was always adept at seeing the big picture. Him going down the river of no returns for 31,000 was besides the point. He knew that he would get so much press out of it. And this was part of his building his own mystique up. Do you dare make a bet with Amarillo Slim? He wears a 10-gallon hat, handmade boots. By the mid-70s, Slim had become one of the most famous gamblers in the world and thus found himself deluged with offers. He made a series of high-stakes proposition bets that seemed laughable. In the first, he wagered that he could beat a racehorse in the 100-yard dash. 
he would win after stipulating that they run 50 yards in one direction and 50 yards back. I designated we go 50 this way and 50 this way. Well, that's 100 yards. Well, I was nearly back before the horse turned around. It was a hot score. Later, he bet tennis great Bobby Riggs that he could beat him at ping pong if he got to choose the paddles. When Slim showed up with a pair of frying pans, Riggs was doomed. Well, he didn't know what to think, but those are our paddles. There's nothing wrong with that being a paddle, and there's a handle on them. And it wasn't a contest. If it had been a fact, they'd have stopped it. He played a game of head-to-head -head seven card stud with Hustler Magazine's Larry Flint and took him for almost two million. He beat country music's Willie Nelson in a highly publicized game of dominoes. And he swindled daredevil Evil Knievel at golf. Slim never met, never heard of a bet that he wouldn't take all night. Well, he could do things that, you know, were out of the ordinary to start with. And then after he planned and trained for something, it was a spectacle just to, just to watch it. I delighted in human misery. It was a tonic for my old skinny body. After taking all comers and hobnobbing with celebrities, Slim decided he'd had enough and slowly began withdrawing from the limelight. He never won another World Series, but he would never stray far from the game, doing promotional work for casinos and various poker events. Slim will always be remembered as one of gambling's greatest figures. The enormous popularity of poker today owes uh, its growth and its origins to Emerald Slim, one of those unforgettable characters that uh, will always be associated with the game. Slim will legacy will be that he was very instrumental in starting poker toward respectability. To tell you the truth, Slim wasn't the degenerate gambler that perhaps I am. He just has a zest for life. He's just done so much. A guy that lived life on his own terms, that experienced life in ways that normal people only dream about, in their wildest fantasies. He says he's always been a cowboy. That'll never change. Well, I'd be a lion if I told you I didn't like that because you feel like uh, fashion through here, you made a little impact in something. Maybe it wasn't good, but uh, at least Jesse James made an impact, you know. So I feel like I have, and I know I have in the poker world. Every place I want to go, I've already been. And everything I want to do, I've already done it. And I'm at peace with me and my maker and the whole world. I'm not looking over my shoulder anywhere I go. That's a good feeling, by the way, to be in a gambling business. He says he's the scam, a $3 million jackpot. How did three ex